and welcome to the Everyday Board Game Podcast with your host, Daniel. And Daniel. Daniel, for once, I'm not being facetious, and I'm actually saying, welcome back. <laughs> that is true. Uh, it's been a couple weeks since we recorded. Uh, the audio side, they're not going to know any difference, uh, because yeah. we, we doubled up on a lot of episodes to the point we're two weeks ahead still. <laughs> yeah, we're still two weeks ahead. Yeah, we, we really ramped it up over the last month. Just to make sure that we were going to be good over the, over these few weeks, that we knew that you were going to be gone. Well, not just that too. We also have to make sure we have a bit of a bubble because you're going to be. You probably can record, but if you're still yeah. you're tired, you're going to be up doing a con. So yeah, give us a little wiggle room. Yeah, exactly. I'm not too worried about it though. It's it's looking good this year. I'm just surprised that it's already August. I mean, like that's that's the crazy part. Well, what's funny when this airs. Uh, It'll be three days before, uh, well, five days before the end of August, three days before my birthday. That's <laughs> yeah, just wild. That That's just absolutely crazy to me. It, it's, we shouldn't be two-thirds through the year already, is all I'm saying. Yeah, well, uh, my wife uh, was messing with me while, um, when, when we get into the Outside of Gaming segment, when, mm-hmm. while we were doing that thing. Uh, she was teasing me. She's like, you realize, like, Christmas is like, five months away now i'm like don't don't start with me woman <laughs> yeah it, 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 she's not wrong though i, mean, <laughs> no, that's, I know that's i was like thing. no there, there was one thing that we, so we ran an errand today and they're like yeah they're gonna have to mail this out and some something gets processed and gets mailed to you and they're like just to let you know it's gonna take probably about 16 to 20 weeks and i was like wow that's december <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like christmas time yeah, what, what exactly. in the world so it might even be longer than that because of the might. Christmas time. <laughs> Very well might. Oh my goodness, I would believe it. That's the silly part. But yeah, I mean, th- this episode that we have, it's a good one to come back to. We have been talking about this one for a while. I've been kind of an ad- advocate for it. And not only just that, like, it it just so happened that uh, at my personal game group, we decided, hey, let's, let's just play this game because we hadn't played it in a long time. And one of my friends was like, yeah, like... Like you haven't played much yet at all? Okay, let's 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 fix that. And Did you play the short version or the long version? We played the long version, but it wasn't too bad. It was four of us, so okay, it wasn't, yeah. wasn't too bad. And then my son, he loves Munchkin, so he was in on that game. So we had a new player, two people who used to play it back in the day. We kind of like ran it under. You know why I think I, your son uh, loves that game so much? Because you could be a jerk in the game. Well, it's not just that. <laughs> he lives by our motto at game night: "Kill the wizard first. That's what he lives That's by. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So much to the point where if if there is a wizard, he'll go for them. <laughs> if I am the wizard, he will kill me. If I if nobody's a wizard, he will kill me. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's not wrong. And then on top of that, I showed off at our local game store. I was like, you know what? Let me show that. I haven't done that in a few months, yeah. at least, you know. And that went over really well. People just like fell in love with that version, you know. And the thing about Munchkin too, uh, now it's a good uh, kind of gateway s game. Sure. I call it gateway s because there's just there's there's a lot of care bear people who come into the hobby they don't yeah. want to be backstabby. Sure. But if you want to get to those crowds that are into the mass market like let's say uh, cards against humanity and stuff mm-hmm. like that this is the the way to introduce them in the actual proper or, or gaming hobby without being vulgar being more family friendly and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, no, it's it's a fantastic game. Um, in fact, it's one of the games that got me into the hobby when we first started. Right. It's one of the first games you showed me. I think it was maybe like the third or fourth game that you showed. Mm-hmm. To the point that Definitely you also first. showed it to our friend Gamehead Geek. And yep. we broke away from that game group because of Munchkin. We used to do Munchkin nights uh, yep. at his house. Yep. And so we started our own little game group. And then you became more of our game group as well. And so... Yep. I munchkin my way onto it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, it gets a lot of bad rep in the gamer community, Community, Yeah, but then at the same time, it's like, guys, get over it. Because the thing is, like, it, it goes back to what we've said before. A game doesn't have to be good to be fun, right? Yeah. And the promise that it fills is that it's, it's a silly game. It doesn't take itself seriously. Yeah, there's take that. Sure, there'll be Care Bears that don't like it. Sure, that, it won't appeal to them. It's fine. Not every game is going to appeal to every gamer. Right. But this game appeals to people who aren't gamers, right? Yeah, exactly. Almost anybody else outside of gaming can probably pick up Munchkin and play it more or less. It, like when I was mentioning earlier, too, when we're talking about like Cards Against Humanity, there's like people who was like, I want to play a game like that that has like mm-hmm. the shenanigans and it's going to make yeah. people laugh. 
but I don't want to take that game over to my grandma's house. I right. Wanna, yeah. So yeah. It, so I always recommended Munchkin. It's like, okay, okay, that's where you're coming from. Try Munchkin. It yep. gives you a little bit of backstabbing. You have a little bit of fun. You're still card playing. You're still joking. You can yell at uh, your buddy over there. So, yeah, no, it's it's a fantastic game. I, I kind of, I want to say I kind of outgrew it. I played the mess out sure. of it when I first got into board gaming. I had several copies of it. I had Legends. I had regular Munchkin. Yep. I have one other copy, if I remember correctly. I can't remember. I don't, and I had the the Munchkin uh, Castle Panic as well. I yep. don't own any of those anymore, um, yep. just because it's something not something that I'm into anymore, or yep. my my tastes evolve, and that's fine too. Am I going to say no if someone's like, "Hey, let's play Munchkin"? Probably not. If yeah, I'm in the mood, I'll, I'll sit yeah. down and play. Sure. It. My issue was that it took a long time. Yeah, it does. And, you know, the thing is, like, so we played as a four-player, like I said, yeah. and it took us maybe an hour and a half. Like, it wasn't It's bad, not too bad, yeah. Right? I mean, long for a card game, sure. But the amount of silliness that we got out of it... Exactly. Yeah, and then our friend, who had never played it before, who's an avid gamer with us, you know, yeah. she has been very much part of our group for the past couple of years, and she learns probably two to three new games Games-up every week, week yeah. you know? So the fact that she had never played that, I'm like, well, I'm shoot, still glad we fix that, and it went over well. That we didn't scare her away for too long with our whole hot dog as a well, sandwich you <laughs> argument. Know, that's true. That's fair. <laughs> but that's that's a whole other topic. Oh, uh, that was hilarious. So that's the, the kind of humor that Munchkin brings out. Yeah, you know, exactly. At the same time. What what did, what did she say? You guys take your sandwiches too seriously, or something like she that. She was like, I think you guys are just. Thinking too much about this. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, we're trying to get her in on the debate, right? Yeah. Like, so what are your thoughts on this? Is a hot dog a sandwich or not? She was like, I don't think it matters. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I can appreciate that stance. That's yeah, but that was sometimes a, being in just an observer and in the background without stating your opinion. That's that's the commendable. Route. And it's funny because I, I think about that and I, I talk with my wife um, about it. Uh, recently, uh, a friend of the podcast passed away. Uh, mm-hmm. He was in this conversation, and that's always one of the most uh, yeah. fun conversations I've ever Vivious. had with him. And it's one of my favorite memories because we were just like, all three of us in that car outside of her were piling on you about the yeah. hot dog sandwich yeah. debate. And I will die on my hill. A hot dog <laughs> is not a sandwich. But we defined it. <laughs> no. A hot dog hey. is a supplement to said hot dog sandwich. <laughs> it is the meat. So, yeah, we were just having a good time with that. And that's one of my favorite memories with uh, this individual, Lincho. Uh, May he rest in peace. It's been almost a year now. Yeah, yeah, So, yeah, and so that always reminds me of him, just how much we were getting into that. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of memories, like, we we love talking about, obviously, gaming brought us all together. And this is why, had it not been for me introducing you to Munchkin and a couple other games throughout those first few weeks, we wouldn't have known each other. Yeah. But... True story, you may not believe this, but we have a life outside of gaming. That we do. Yeah. And so. hence the whole conversation that we were just talking about. So uh, before I get into my outside of gaming, what is yours? So uh, listeners of the podcast know uh, something very interesting happened in my life. Uh, we went through the gauntlet of birthdays, as I call it. <laughs> and um, I now officially have two teenagers. I have a 13 and a 15 year old. And my son, he goes to an early college. Wait, 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 wait. No, no. Let's rephrase this. You have a... How old's your son? 15. And how old's your daughter? 13. 16. <laughs> 16. No. 16. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's, been, she's been 16 since for about... Eight? For about 11 years now. Yeah. So, sure, there's that. But no, we like legally have yeah, teenagers, yeah. right? Um, mathematically, we have teenagers. Teenagers. And so that, the wild thing is, my son, he goes to high school right now, mm-hmm. and he's taking early college high school and all that stuff, and one of the programs, since he had to do that, he has to go through summer school, and one of the programs that they offered him was driving school. Oh, Lord. <laughs> he now has a learning permit, and we have been taking him out driving lately, something that I did not expect to happen so darn fast. My worry initially, and this is just, you know, if he listens, then he, he knows that he likes to troll from time to time. As we said earlier, he loves Munchkin. Yep. That's not an accident. Um, he loves trolling. He loves picking on people. Like, he just, he there's a lot of times where if he's in the zone, he's not taking things seriously. And he's just causing all kinds of shenanigans. Whether it's 
good or bad, I don't know. He's just causing causing shenanigans. So our initial thought was like, man, we hope he doesn't just decide to randomly troll while driving. That, that has been my biggest fear. I think he's going to be very capable of driving, very good at it. But well, no, I've been in the car with you. So. <laughs> what is that? You're the one who made half of my tire fly off. Remember that. <laughs> that was not me, all right? I was just driving at the time. I took over after you. You did the damage. It just fully went off. It, no, that that I had to take on, on the, yours entirely. <laughs> don't put it on. Don't put that juju on me, Ricky you, you Bobby. Can't, you can't claim it on me then. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have pieces flying off of my car when we, when I was driving. And it wasn't the tire either. It yeah, was no, the, it was the uh, wheel hub. Or the whatever. wheel hub. Yeah, yeah. sure. From Man, that was a rough day, though. <laughs> Man, like, witch. I don't claim to be a very angry person. I know I'm not, but that was probably the angriest you've ever seen me. I was pretty, pretty upset. Yeah, you w- were not. Would you the say best. that that was probably like the 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 least happy I've ever been Mm-mm. around you? Really? Nope. Wow. Okay. We'll go into. I don't want to. Uh, no, no. I'll go up. into the I'll details see. about when I, the. It was when your daughter did something. Uh... Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. Par- parenting aside. Yeah, a parenting aside, yes. Forgot about that. Speaking of my children, right? Uh, but yeah, so we've been training my son how to drive, and we're starting um, where everyone in our town learns to drive, and that's the Pan Am Center, that massive parking lot mm-hmm. with like nothing in it. That or the mall when it's at night. Right, the mall at night. Yep, that's a good one. I'm worried about that hill, though. We have a massive hill on the side of one. They of have to learn to drive hills. No, I mean, like, that's that's not a driving off the... I'm talking the west side, where it falls into the highway. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, I'm not too worried about Movie it, theater but, side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or by uh, the Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, we, but we've been taking him out, um, driving around the neighborhood, and... He's been very great about being serious, being focused, and my my wife was hesitant to teach him. She's like, no, Danny, you need to teach him. No option. Like, she was like, I, my, the way she was taught how to drive was her mother grabbing onto the bar and just going, uh, uh, like, while she was behind the wheel. Well, so she was, she was raised by, um, Hispanic, uh, well, descent. Well, sure. Yeah, no, yeah. my dad was, you know what my dad did? He, he threw, the threw the keys, keys at, at me and, and said, have at it. it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not even Hispanic and I understand. No. <laughs> And, and so I told my son a lot of the things that I learned how to do while driving is because I'm I'm a night owl and he's turning into one. Yeah. Is that once I got once I got to the point where I was comfortable on the road, going out at night was the best time for me because there was no traffic. I could Less take traffic, it. Traffic. Yeah. I could take it at ease. You know. Yes, it's harder to see in the, a little bad depth perception, but it was still more comfortable for me. And so they always tell you you need like 50 hours of driving, 10 of which have to be at, yeah, night. at night. Mine was. 50 hours of driving, 10 of which was during the day. <laughs> like, kind of thing. I learned at night. Yeah. So, yeah, we're just going through that. Um, it's just hard to believe that, you know, by the time he gets his provisional, he'll already be halfway through 15 years old. I'm going to love the days when you got to teach your daughter how to drive. I might I might make my son do it <laughs> if he's pretty good at it. Oh, um, that poor boy. <laughs> <laughs> No, you have to be over 21 before. Yeah, I know. I was like, wait. So she's waiting until she's 19 to drive. (laughs) (laughs) That's why she's going to (laughs) learn. She'll just have to get a boyfriend that'll drive. Because I I was thinking about the fact that um, your son, though can be snarky, he's very respectful. He is. Your daughter cuts to the quick, man. (laughs) She's she's sharp. (laughs) She's the kind of person that would like... Like she, if if she saw somebody else doing something <laughs> weird and driving, she'll she'll cut them down. <laughs> like she'll verbally just go, "Yo, <laughs> like I'm and I'm glad your feet smell." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like she, I I can't even wait to see what her reactions are going to be. Uh, do do you tell your son? I know everybody cracked up about it, but now that he's driving, just remember if someone's so aggressive aggressive with you when they're driving, just remember it's me first, me first, like a toddler. Yeah, <laughs> no, he 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 was very much like. Uh, by the way, listeners of the podcast, let me <laughs> pro tip, ready pro tip. I am like the least angry driver. I am very calm driver. I'm not. People don't people don't frustrate me while driving. I don't really and, flip people off, but I will cuss them out in the privacy of my own car. Yeah, see, I don't even do that. I'm like, hmm. All right, well, yeah. they're, they're driving that way. That's their choice, right? Yeah. But one of my favorite things, and I've been teaching this to a lot of people, 
thank me later. Uh, feel free to send us an email at everydayboardgames2020 at gmail.com thanking me about this technique. Here's what you do. If you see anybody driving angrily and cutting, cutting you off or whatever, driving aggressively, just imagine the kid you knew when you were eight years old going, me first, me first, cutting you off in line. If you remember that <laughs> and you hear that voice in your head when that car is cutting you off, you will... N- you will not be able to keep a straight face and you will not have to worry about having a stressful drive again. It's so worth it. <laughs> Just me first, me first. Yeah, but now it's you have a whole my new... My turn. It's mine. You I want to go whole, me first. You have a whole new meaning to stressful driving and <laughs> trying to teach your kids how to drive. Yeah, no, that's all right. Let's see. How many gray hairs do you have now? <laughs> no, I thought you were laying on a game over here. I was like, what's going on? There's gray hairs over there? No, none that I know of yet. My wife, however. <laughs> or her. <laughs> like she, she, she names which hair is from which kid. She's like, this one's from my son. This one's from my daughter. These four are from you, and you know, like she'll she'll straighten them out. And yeah, that's what I started doing with my beard. And I'm like, this is Calissa. Yeah, this yeah. is Calissa. Yep. This is Calissa. This one's the dog. This right? is the dogs right yeah. over here because yeah. you know they pissed on the the furniture or something like oh, that. Of course they did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course they did. So that's been my outside of gaming. What have you been doing? So my outside of gaming, uh, as we mentioned, leading up to all the past recordings that we did, that yep. I was getting ready to go on the cruise. It well, finally happened. It finally happened. Yeah. I went on my Alaskan cruise. I have a breakdown of how it went, so I'll go uh, try to run through it pretty quickly. But yeah, no, it was uh, it was a blast. First off, the weather in Seattle and the weather up in Alaska was gorgeous. And then I come back over here and it's 102 degrees uh, <laughs> after dealing with like... Yeah. Low 80s to 50s and 60s. Yeah, low 80s max. Max. Right? That's that high. was the highest. Yeah. I think the highest temperature we got was 82 degrees, and that was in Seattle. Yeah. We're, we're barely below that on our low yeah. at night. At night. So, yeah, it was it was quite a stark difference when it comes to weather. Mm-hmm. So we spent a couple days in Seattle on our Alaskan cruise, and I made sure to make notes on my phone here. Okay. Uh, we went into... Well, so we left so Saturday what, morning. So what cruise company was We it? went through Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean, okay. We, um, like I said, spent two nights. We flew in that Saturday, and we spent uh, half the day of sa- Saturday just sure. learning the neighborhoods. By the way, their streets are confusing like you wouldn't believe uh, sure. Seattle streets. Uh, so when you're using GPS, it's telling you to take a sharp right or take right or go right. But when, the way we were learning the streets, is like, there's three rights. Which Sharp right, okay, the, so it wants us to make this one that's immediately almost like a U-turn and have us go in this spot. <laughs> no, wow. the sharp right was the one in the middle. It wasn't the first right. It wasn't the, it was the middle right, not the sharp right. I'm like, but that's not the sharp right. <laughs> what was it, like extreme right? Yeah, I, I guess. It like never, your we never had to, to go on the ground <laughs> right? Like, we never had to go on those. And so I told my Rocky, we, or my wife, we had to play by the Rocky rules. And she's like, Rocky? I'm like, yeah, the movie Rocky. When he's like, he's saying, he's seen like them in triple. Aim for the middle one. That's the one we're going for. Yeah. And so, yeah, so it was interesting. Those roads are weird. But Seattle itself is a really nice city. I had enjoyed my time there uh the first time we visited the queen anne in fremont area Mm -hmm. which was really cool um went to a game store there blue highway games i think is what it was called picked up some stuff there then uh we really enjoyed the queen anne side so we started walking that area we ended up getting going to a a frozen yogurt shop that had a no sugar uh strawberry yogurt which was delicious had a good time there sunday was my favorite day in seattle uh, we had a breakfast at a place called uh, Roxy's Diner. I want to give them a shout out. It is okay. a Jewish diner in the, uh, I believe it's the Fremont area. It is the first time I've ever had latkes, which is like a potato pancake yeah. type thing. It was delicious. It was probably one yeah. of the best things I ate there uh, was okay. those latkes. It was really good. Uh, afterwards, we went to the Woodland Zoo, uh, uh, the Seattle Zoo, because my wife likes zoos. I enjoy zoos, so we walked around, had a good time there. Um I posted some pictures. I don't know if I posted pictures of the zoo, but you can go to our Instagram. Yeah, you I posted, posted something some, about birds. I uh, saw that. I don't know if that was wild. Mm, yeah, So, but there is pictures of some of the stuff I did in Seattle. Yeah. Um, I believe so. Um, we also, after the zoo, we went to the famous Pikes Place, which is like the their fisherman wharf and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was really neat. Really crowded. Like, super crowded. There was a point where me and my wife were like, 
now we're done and we went else uh not we didn't leave pike's place but we went actually towards the pier stuff where the the ferris wheel is because it was so like shoulder shoulder in that market area and it's like it's too much yeah really too much so we're like okay that's really cool uh but it was still neat Uh, had a lot of cool stuff um walking around there taking some pictures you can actually see the football and baseball stadium Right there, where uh, from where we were, and I, in fact, I showed the guys a picture of it just yeah, for one of our did. friends. Yeah, yep. and it's like that's the this football stadium. For you. <laughs> this is this is specifically for Dammit Dom because he's into sports like I am, and, and he really likes football. And Lumens Field was right there, so I was like, and it, it, it was pretty far from where we are. It was about two miles, but that's a massive stadium. We drove well, you right can see it two miles away, right? Yeah, yeah. and we drove uh, by it when we were coming into Seattle. So it is really cool. Uh, like I was telling the wife, I wish there was a game going on. I would have gone to see a Seattle Mariners game. Sure. But they were out of town in Chicago, no less. Ironically enough, <coughs> you will one day. I, yeah, and so <laughs> we ate lunch there. Um, well, it was kind of like a late lunch, early dinner type thing at a Bolivian restaurant. Oh, wow. okay. which was really good food, a little heavy-handed on salt. Uh, I'm not someone who likes really salty food. They were a sure. bit heavy-handed on that, but other than that, it was really good. I had a, uh, it was almost like a chili Colorado, if you're familiar with the, the Mexican, and right now I can't roll my tongues because my mouth is a little dry, but it's a Mexican dish where it's like, the, I think it's beef, or no, it's pork in uh, Colorado. What's the dish again? Chili Colorado. Chili Colorado. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a stew with red chili and stuff like that. Okay. This is the same thing, but it's made with beef, uh, and it was, like, really, really tender. It was really, really good. Not as spicy as you can get some of the stuff out here because they use different types of uh, peppers over there. Okay. But it was really good. Enjoyed it. Um, then after that, we actually decided we needed to hit a grocery store because we wanted to take some sodas for us to go on the cruise. Sure. Because we didn't pay for the drink package. because screw that. Ooh, it was expensive. Yeah. Yeah, for for the sodas, just sodas. Yeah, it's like thirty a day, right? Fifteen dollars or is eighteen dollars a day per person for a seven day cruise? Yeah, and I was like, mm, now nah, I'm good. I'll bring a twelve pack. Yeah. So I ended up taking a uh, Barks uh, root beer. But before that, we hit another board game store called uh, Mox Boarding House. I uh, picked up a few games there, and I made you made the joke like, "Dude, are you gonna have any room to take care, bring all this stuff back?" I'm like, "Dude, I packed two bags. I'm gonna be on this cruise for seven days, so yeah. <laughs> throw some of your clothes overboard. Then you make room for <laughs> yeah. that new game." So uh, we did that. Monday comes around, uh, we had to buy some time because we couldn't get on the boat till one o'clock. So we dropped off the yeah. car. Then we just uh, well, we walked around downtown uh, Saint Seattle. Uh, left our suitcases in the car and stuff like that. We parked in a parking lot uh, garage. Just walked around. Went to the um, the uh, Seattle Kraken shop where I bought this hat because that was one of my specific things. Is I want to buy a Kraken hat while I'm in Seattle. I'm a big hockey fan. We've discussed that outside of gaming. After that, just walked around, looked at the Space Needle, decided we weren't going to spend that kind of money for the Space Needle. It's cool and everything. I'm not yeah. a fan of heights. She's not a fan of heights. I'm not paying. It was like 40 bucks per person. Yeah. And it was crowded, too. Mind you, it was also raining, so you're not going to get any views. It's going to be a bunch of clouds. Yeah. So we were just like, you know what? Screw it. It's cool. I got to see the Space Needle. I don't need to go up the Space Needle. It's not like for you when you had to go do the arch because it's the yeah. National Park. Yeah. I've been there, done that. It's cool. But I'll go with you guys just to hang out with you guys. But... Yeah. Uh, same thing with the Space Needle. I was like, I saw it. It's cool. I'd rather walk downtown. It was a beautiful downtown, sure, yeah. even though it was, it was raining. Uh, got to see the Kraken's Arena. We walked right. by at the Climate Pledge Arena, I think that's what it's called. Um, and afterwards, we got onto our boat at 1 o'clock. Um, and honestly, just checked out the boat, saw what was going on. Uh, so afterwards, we had a day at sea, so wasn't much going on that, uh, that Tuesday. We played some games. Um... Uh, we walked around the ship. We ate on the ship. Uh, we had a private balcony, so that was always nice. Which uh, is awesome. On uh, the boat, yeah. Yeah, I literally just, every morning I would sit outside and drink my coffee. Yeah. And so I had a good time just with that alone. Getting the ocean breeze in there, you know. Oh, yeah. And we actually left uh, our door open quite a bit yep. just to let the, the cool air in. Uh, but Wednesday we poured in Sitka, which was nice. Uh, it was a beautiful place. That was probably the wettest day uh, that we had because it was raining a lot in Sitka, so we were double coated. It was actually really cool too. I think it was, I think the high got to like fifty five degrees Ooh. and stuff like that. So, 
But we, we took a hike there. We hiked the Totem National Park in uh, Sitka, Alaska, which is gorgeous. A bunch of totem poles. There's a nice little museum. Beautiful hike. Little chill. I sent some pictures to the guys and stuff like that. Just the forest alone was magnificent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's what, Alaska is by far one of the most beautiful places I've ever visited. It was There's something about it. And I didn't even go to Alaska proper. I was right. basically in the islands the yeah. whole time. Yeah. Um, we ate lunch at a local restaurant. I can't think of the name there, but uh, my wife doesn't eat fish. I'm not a huge fish eater. A lot of it was like fried stuff, uh, and I kind of keep back on my carbs and stuff like that. Yeah. So I did have um, chicken wings there, which were pretty good, pretty good local chicken wings. Uh, cool. Another thing about uh, Sitka when we did the hiking, lots of wild animals, lots of birds, and you know I'm a birder. Yeah, you are. Salmon were jumping out of the water. Oh, wow. You get to okay. watch them just kind of flipping and flopping, watching birds uh, try to hunt them. Uh, did get to see a juvenile bald eagle in the wild eating a salmon. That's it literally cool. caught a salmon in the stream and was just eating it in front of us, and we were like, that was like the coolest thing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Sitka was really nice. I love the history of Sitka. It used to be an old Russian um, town. It used to be one of their like fur ports or whaling ports and stuff like that. Really neat. Hmm. Um, went back, to, uh, shopped around for some souvenirs, went back to the ship after... We got back to the ship probably close to when we were supposed to board, about 3 o'clock or so, 4 o'clock, because we needed to make the next port, which is fine. Got in, went upstairs to use the hot tub, which I will say this about the, the Royal Caribbean that we had. They had a thing called the Solarium. Yep. Was th almost You're three, me about yeah, this. Almost 360 yeah. views of everywhere uh, there. And it was adult only, so it was only 18 and above, so we can go over there and drink and relax and not hear about or hear screaming and yelling and shouting. Because it is also a family cruise, but sometimes adults yeah. want to have... At least not from kids. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, it was actually... <laughs> <laughs> it was know. quite quiet there. And what was neat about it, too, is after we were leaving, there was a little, like, uh, viewing deck that you can go out, mm -hmm. out of the solarium. And so me and the wife went out there after we got out of the hot tub. Mind you, it was chilly. We had dried off because it was a nice, warm solarium. Uh, so we go out there, and we're just listening to the sounds of Alaska. And you can hear diff different animals. You can hear the eagles calling to each other. Of course, the gulls and stuff like that. Yep. So it was really, really neat. And that was just Sitka. That was our first proper day in Alaska. Then we hit wow. by far the coldest day because it was 52 degrees when we were out uh, and about on this town. But before that, um, there was another colder day, but we never left the boat on that day um, until we hit a certain point. Because it was, it was one of those late port days. But this one we head to Skagway. So it was really cool. It was right. overcast. But it was it was beautiful. We we had our jackets on. We were fine. Skagway is by far one of the prettiest small towns I've ever seen. There, It's kind of like a classic western style in a sense type town mm -hmm. that you see. Like Rio Doso still has like that sure. town square out near where we are. That's how Skagway was. We mainly didn't do any expeditions that you could have done some stuff, like you could have done the rail and stuff like that. But we're like, no, let's just go visit. Let's go do some shopping. That was probably one of our favorite places to go. Oh, yeah. We had coffee, and we decided to go right when we could get off the boat at 8.30. We had our breakfast, and then we, we went away, went off. And it worked out for us in a sense because we were the first boat in, but there was two other boats that ported that day. By the time... We were done doing everything. We were ready to go back to our boat. It was almost lunchtime. So it's like, okay, we'll just go back to the boat and eat lunch there because mm -hmm. the restaurants were getting really busy. Come to find out, it's because there's two other boats there. How's it going, Masmos? Hey, Masmos. And so, yeah, it was quite busy. So by the time we get back on the boat, everybody's off the boat because they're in Skagway. We went up to the solarium after lunch and just hung out in the hot tub for three hours. There was like five other people there. Wow. Not including the staff. So we basically had a whole hot tub to ourselves. A 15-person hot tub to ourselves. That's awesome. It was quite nice. Uh, relaxing. Um, once everybody started getting back on the boat, we decided to go down, shower, and get ready for dinner. Went to dinner. Did some shopping on the boat. And I'll explain what we bought on the boat here in a minute. After that, we, on Friday, because we left port about 5.30. On Friday, and this is why it was the coldest, mm -hmm. I didn't mention how weird time was over there yeah because sunrise was a little after 4 a.m in the morning sunset was after 10 p.m it was short short days over there yep and so we got up at 4 30 in the morning on friday 
because we were going to be going by a glacier. Uh, they were actually going into, I think it's called the Dawes Passage, or, mm -hmm. or the Indus Scott, one of those two, for you uh, to see the glacier. So we took some pictures. It was freezing. It was 47 degrees. We didn't even get into it because they told us we were going to get into that passage at 4.30. We didn't even get to the glacier uh, till like 6 a.m. Saw it, went down, took a little nap, had breakfast. <coughs> then um, the reason why we were up and ready is because at 1 o'clock we ported in Juneau, Alaska, the state capital of Alaska, which was my favorite place to go to because it had we paid for an expedition that I wanted to do for my entire life. And it was one of my favorite things that we've done ever. And we went while watching. Mm -hmm. uh, so yep. we got a, uh, we got on a bus that drove us to another bay in Juneau. Yep. We got on a tinier boat and drove out to the inside passage to go whale watching. And we caught uh, some uh, humpback whales feeding. Mind you, what's interesting and what we got lucky for is because they tell you, we had something very rare there. Humpback mm -hmm. whales don't, have pods they're kind of a solo mammal and stuff like that so the only time you see like a group of whales together it's usually because it's a mother and a calf well yeah. we hit what was called i think it's called a, a garm or a gam or something like that where it was a bunch of like friendly whales who have um, met up with each other from time to time and we're all feeding together hmm. so instead of seeing just maybe one or two whales we saw six including wow. a calf Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that was really neat, you know, watching them. Uh, and there, there's certain rules that they have to do on the ship. So our specific ship could not get closer, close to the whales. They can only sure. park about 100 yards away or 100 feet from the whales. We were lucky enough that there was another, there was a sister ship that came out with us, and they were on the other side. The whales moved towards our ship, so they didn't move, or we didn't move. They moved towards us, and so we had welfare. some... Uh, amazing pictures of the whales. I actually sent one to you guys. I took a video yep. of uh, the calf uh, breaching the water, jumping out of the water, and I took a, uh, um, a picture out of that. I took it out of it while it's in midair, and everybody's like, oh, that's so cool. I'm like, I know. <laughs> that was one of the greatest things <laughs> to become a whale writer. <laughs> yeah. Hop yeah. on. I'm sure, I'm sure they won't mind. Yeah, yeah. So, but it was... Fantastic! I didn't. Want, I would not want to get in that water. They were saying the water temperature was like forty-five degrees. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm good, because <laughs> it was near the glacier. So, yep. uh, so fantastic aspect of Juno. Uh, then we were back to sea after Juno for a whole day. So my wife really enjoyed that because it was like the warmest day we've had for a while. I think it was seventy-two degrees out where we were. So she's out, you know, just spending time on the, the deck. I was out there. I was reading my book. She was uh, um, basically sunbathing and playing on her phone and stuff like that. So because she has games on her phone that she was playing and just enjoying the time in our, each other's company without even talking. Yep. We watched movies. We hung out. We did some more shopping on the boat. But I think the Sunday was my wife's favorite day because... That day was the first time we've been to a different country in about a year uh, when we went to the Bahamas this time when we hit Victoria, Canada. Yep. And the reason why this was important for my wife, there is a famous garden in Victoria, Canada that she's always wanted to see, always wanted to go to. When she found out that I could pay for an expedition, she asked me, and I was like, I already paid for it. So she, she got super happy. We went to the Bouchard Gardens out of Victoria, um, uh, Canada. And if you don't know what they are, you should look them up. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous place. They have a thing where it used to be a whole uh, mining company where they cut out limestone. And one of their most famous things, it's a sunken garden. So what the wife did is that she started, because she wanted somewhere to hang out and have people come over for tea time and stuff like that. So that limestone minery, once it was done, she built a garden into it. And so it literally is just a drop off into an old uh, pit. Wow. It's gorgeous. Uh, some of the pictures my wife has, I'll have to show them to you. But Yeah. But no, it was gorgeous. Before that, we had a butterfly garden that had like birds, iguanas, and just beautiful butterflies saw some giant walking sticks and it was it was cool but that garden is massive it's large we didn't even get to see the italian gardens because we had to get back to our bus because it was a short uh, that was my only complaint is that we didn't have a lot of time in canada yeah because we did sure. the bouchard gardens uh, expedition we did that and that alone we immediately had to go back to our ship yeah. because our ship would leave at nine o'clock because we had to be at port uh 
uh, in Seattle the next day. Yeah. So we didn't have a lot of time there, but other than that, it was a fantastic trip. Uh, seeing those the garden and stuff like that. That was my wife's favorite. I personally preferred the whale watching. I just thought that was amazing. Yeah. We flew back Monday, coming back to this ridiculous heat, but yeah, no. <laughs> so I told the wife, for me personally, that it was the the greatest trip I've ever been on. That's awesome. I've been on a lot of good trips. Like, going to the Bahamas for my anniversary was fantastic. <clears throat> All the Disney trips I've done with my wife and our friends and stuff like that. Uh, going to Tennessee and seeing, like, Graceland. Uh, going yep. to Gamma Expo in Louisville, which to the point where we were... Actually, pleasantly surprised of... Uh, yeah, let's let's be real. We knew that that wasn't your top trip. Yeah. It was fun. It, it was, was fun. great. Gamma's always great to yeah, us. Yeah, no, no, no. I always have a good time, but I was just saying, like, out of everything I've ever yeah. done, this by far was one of the best things, because it was one of my bucket list things. Yeah. Is going to Alaska. The fact that I got to throw Canada into it, and yes, Masmo Canada... Uh, That's right. ...was fantastic. My only issue with cruises yeah. is you don't go to, through ports of entries... So once you your cruise has your passport and everything, you're good. You just need your card and ID. Yep. So I don't have any stamps in my passport. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. And that's my only thing is like, I want stamps in my passport to show I visit any places. Yeah. But I'm sure no. somebody could draw it in there if you pay them enough. You know? I know some places they'll have like stamps that you can put into it, but I'm, I've always been afraid of doing that because it's like, mm, don't want to, you know, mess with yeah. a government document <laughs> per se. Sure. Uh, so no, but it was a fantastic trip. We had a blast. Uh, the The weather was gorgeous. the The experience was gorgeous. Now I posted some pictures on my personal uh, Facebook, and I did post some on our, our our Instagram. But I didn't take a lot of pictures. I for One seven days. Experience, right? Yeah, for seven days, I think I took maybe thirty, maybe forty photographs. Okay, which is just and those are all whales. <laughs> Some of them were, yes. Uh, but it's more because I just wanted to live in there. My wife took a lot of pictures. That's another thing, too. It's like, I know she's yep. going to be taking the pictures. I want to take some stuff, but I want to remember the right. experiences that we had. And then, like like I posted in my Facebook post earlier, it was a good thing to just connect with my wife because she travels a lot with her job. And so the, this forced us not to be spending time on our phone. Yep. Uh, we spent a lot of time just talking to each other, watching movies together, Um or just even her laying in bed, playing her Switch while I'm reading a book or something like that. And just hanging out and enjoying yeah. each other's company. Because the hustle and bustle, you just forget to slow down and just hang out with your spouse. And so mm -hmm. that was fantastic. But I did buy two watches while I was on the ship. I bought two new Evictus. I'll, I'll have to show them to you later. But yeah, I did buy those two new watches. She, uh, I got her a bracelet. She's got a bunch of necklaces that we bought. Because my wife loves wearing necklaces, but unique we necklaces. In fact... She's got three fossil necklaces now because we all bought them in the same area of Skagway. Wow. She's got a ancient walrus necklace, uh, the fossil uh, from ivory, uh, an ancient uh, mammoth ivory tusk uh, pendant, and then she's also got an ammonite pendant. Yeah, because <laughs> my awesome. wife loves fossils, by the way. So yeah, no, Nerd. no, no, we had a we had a good time. So it was a fantastic trip, um, and I really enjoyed it. Cool. So let's get into today's topic. Uh, we're going to be brainstorming Munchkin. Again, this game came out early 2000s. I want to say either t 2001, I want to say. Give or take. Something so it's like about that, yeah. 23 years old now. And, jeez, oh, wow, that's hard to believe. It's, in, it's old enough to drink. Yeah, uh, that's crazy. That's the description it makes. But, and it, it is a game of pure just silliness. What, if you don't know what Munchkin is, um, how did you find our podcast, first off? <laughs> But secondly... <laughs> no, there's a lot of new gamers that don't true. play Munchkin. That's true. Munchkin is kind of cult of the old, right? But it, it got a lot of people into gaming, at least around when we started. Yep. Um, like, what, 10 years ago? And it, it still sells really well. Because yep. what Munchkin is, it's from Steve Jackson Games, and it was his card game where I don't remember specifically why he chose the term Munchkin. I think that's a term in Dungeons & Dragons of just, like, you know, kind of a shenanigans character, whatever. Anyway, the... What this is, is it's basically a spoof card game of Dungeons & Dragons, yep. right? Or gen generic fantasy, role-playing, whatever, yep. right? And you have these cards. Every turn, you kick down a door. You encounter whatever monster it is, if there is a monster. And you're trying to be the first character to get to level 10. First one to do it by defeating a monster wins. All you do is compare the level that's on the monster. And is you, if you have a combat level with your personal level plus all your buffs... <laughs> 
if that exceeds their level, then you just beat automatically. Yep. What makes this game silly is that all the, everything is just like a comical version. Like you have a floating nose or like the level one potted plant that you fight against. Or like uh, the boots of butt kicking or some foot gear you can have that has a big old spike on the toe. Right? And it's and it's all just making fun of it. And it's very uh, very charming with the John Kavalik art, um, which Ian McGinty ended up doing some of the art for many of the later versions. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. Like, wait, no. And so, but John Kavalik, I mean, that was like his big, big one, right? That yeah. everyone knows him from. They created the character Spike, and it's just a universally well known uh, game. So if you haven't played it, it's definitely worth a try always once, unless you're like a really hardcore European gamer, um, then you'll hate it. Well, but yeah. if you're okay with silliness, shenanigans, random luck of the draw, some take that, then this is really a game for you. So Some backstabby, some negotiation sometimes. Yeah, there's some negotiation. I love it when it's like, hey, I'll offer to help you with that, fight that monster. And they're like, nah, I don't need your help. They offered me a better deal. Cool. I'm going to add plus five to it then. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. And that, that's the move where everyone's like, well, you're a jerk. And well done. And, and that happens almost every time. But, you know, we brought this up earlier is that we played it a lot back in the day. Oh, yeah. And we've cooled on it. So we have found, um, we're each going to give you recommendations for five different games. Um, there might be some crossover. We haven't looked at each other's lists. Um, four our five criteria to give you recommendations to try out if either you've cooled on it or you don't like certain aspects of it. Hopefully this will help you find your next favorite game. And another thing about it too is like even though if we have crossover, sometimes it's not in the same category. So you might have something in Meaningful Choice where I think it fits more in game immersion. So sure, yeah. Pick your poison in that aspect that's more along the lines right. of like, do I want something that's going to give me more Meaningful Choice or something that's going to get more thematic? Well, here, right. this hits both of us on different criteria, so. So it must be a good sign. Yeah. Cool. All right, well then let's get into this. Uh, we're going to start with Ease of Play. Um, and as always, we're going to flip our coin of doom to see who begins first. How's it uh, going, Illuminous? Hey, Illuminous, welcome. So Ease of Play, what we do is we break it into three sub-criteria. It was simplicity and familiarity with the mechanisms, how likely it is to get to the table, whether it's mechanism or theme, and finally, is it easy to learn, understand, or teach? Munchkin overall is not a difficult game to learn. There is a bit of a learning curve just because there is a lot of silliness. And I think the very first person who, um, the very first person who, or the first time you ever play it, it is a little daunting because mm -hmm. there's every card is different and unique. You're like, well, can I hold this gear? Like, what can I do with these? Like, the cards aren't really like categorized in a way that makes sense a lot. And so, Stuff and like there's that. also cheating cards in there too. Where yeah. There's active, like, silly cards that allow you to cheat. But the thing I went with Ease of Play is that a lot of the game really builds itself ha halfway through the game, where at first you're just, like, playing the motions. You're like, okay, this is the first step. I flip over a card. Then, if I can, I deal with it. Then, on my next step, I'm gonna draw some, or I'm, I might draw cards, like treasures or something. That will give me better chances to do later on. Mm -hmm. If I can't defeat it, you know... Other people can offer me help, you know, and then yeah. we have some wheeling and dealing because they'll normally name a price. It's like, I'll help you, but I need two of those treasures. Yeah. Because you're going to gain two live or uh, two um, levels. levels out of it. So, you know, there's a lot of wheeling and dealing. So I wanted to find a game that embodied that where, unfortunately, this game, I did avoid tr uh, take that in this, but ease of play as far as flip over a card, deal with what it does, and then a lot of wheeling and dealing involved in that. I picked Bonanza. This is probably my least recommended, and it definitely is a different theme and a different flavor, Yeah. but I feel like the same learning curve where halfway through the game people finally get, it's like, oh, you know what, I'll trade you these cards so you don't trade with him. Or <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, I'll help you, but if you don't help me, I'm going to hurt you real bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of that silly back and forth that I feel really led into that, and by the end of the first game, you'll definitely have it under control, and then future games from there, you'll be able to pick it up and and dive right into the silliness. Your thoughts, Daniel? So, my ease of play pick... I don't know, it's kind of weird to me on that one. Uh, it is. It's very much not the theme, right? Yeah. It's a very different game, but I felt it had the same ease of play. My uh, ease of play pick, I went... With something a little different, what you're saying, uh, I just went with something that has a familiarity you're, uh, with how you mentioned with Munchkin, you draw a card and then figure out what cards you can do to deal with it type thing. 
I decided to go that kind of route, but um, more of you're familiar with the mechanism, and this is Yahtzee. This is a Yahtzee-esque game that gives you a bunch of shenanigans like Munchkin does. Gives you a lot of that like table talk where you're yelling at each other, but it's, it's so very simple. And for me, this game, for ease of play, is King of Tokyo. Oh, I thought your recommendation was Yahtzee. I was like, what? No, what no. Talking? Okay, King of Tokyo makes way more sense. Yeah. Okay, carry on. My criticism was gone. is gone now. It gives you the shenanigans that you like <laughs> for Munchkin. You yeah. like the, the little backstabbing. Sure. Or, the, or maybe the wheeling and dealing is like, well, you go in there and go in there. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 go let's ahead. see how last long you last in there. Bring me all the claws. <laughs> oh, yeah, that win. sort of thing. Yeah. And so I love that aspect. Uh, one of my favorite memories, uh, when you listen to the... Um, uh, it, uh, how we talked with Gamehead Geek yeah. was the fir- one of the first games him and me ever played was uh, uh, King of King Tokyo, Tokyo. Yep. and I was I forget what the Godzilla s creature is sure. called uh, Gigazor Gigazor yeah when uh, we were playing with the power ups and I had detachable tell that helped me the win and so this could have fit in game immersion where it can lead you to those memorable moments and stuff like that. But I went with this one because, one, all you're doing is you're rolling your dice. You keep your set of dice that you want to keep, and you roll two more times, or you can accept your roll however it is. You get power-ups as you're going by based on your energy levels uh, that you have stored up. You win by either um, having your turn completely, a full turn staying in Tokyo, or getting 20 points. Very simple. The, the same thing with Munchkin is the first one to 10. So you, you have a goal in King of Tokyo is to be the first one to 20 or have a successful full turn in uh, Tokyo itself. So um, when you go into Tokyo and you get to the top level of Tokyo and if it gets back to your turn, you win. I think in King of New York. No, King of Tokyo. You win if you stay in Tokyo for the entire turn. No, you just got two points. Whatever it is, but... It's still yeah. fantastic. Uh, it's been a while since I played King of Tokyo. I remember you, you get it. I, I did hit the 20 points when I won, and it's because I didn't get knocked out yeah. into Tokyo because I had the detachable tail that took all hits for oh, me. Oh, yeah. That's pretty good. But, yeah, no, it's a simple Yahtzee rolls. You roll your dice. You yeah. tick what you want out of it. And my personal favorite about King of Tokyo, it gives you the same shenanigans that you'll get from Munchkin sure. in half the time. Yeah, and so King of Tokyo is my pick for ease of play. Okay, yeah, I don't disagree with that. I mean, it definitely has that same flavor, right? Yeah. The silliness, over the top, <coughs> uh, which I'll be giving some recommendations for here in a bit. Yeah. But our next one, replay value, which is the length of time and scaling well, the minimum number of plays for the full experience, and the expandability if it already has expansions, or expansions that have been confirmed by the designer or publisher. And so for me, this one was a bit one of the easier ones for me to come out with, because. Going along the lines with Munchkin, you have some expansions, but mostly it's a bunch of standalone games. Sure. Uh, you have they are technically f- compatible. They, but yeah, yeah. You have your you own flavor games. Sure. You have Legends, which do- deals with more with historical kind of mm-hmm. stuff. You have regular Munchkin, which is the generic fantasy. Yep. You have uh, Kung it, Fu. Kung, you yeah. have Goth. You have yeah. What is that Nightmare yeah. Before Christmas? Yeah. Now you even have like. Uh, Marvel, Disney Munchkin, and you have like X Men Munchkin. Yep, yeah, so sure. There's a bunch of flavors for Munchkin, and so I wanted to get a game that kind of like that. But I also wanted to go the route you did with Bonanza and go with a card game that does something like that. So for me, my pick is Flux. Okay. It's your it. There's a bunch of uh, shenanigans. Uh, you're basically playing cards out uh, that uh, can lend you to the goal as long as you meet the requirement of the goal. Sometimes it's with keepers, sometimes it's not. But again, it's one of those pick your poison types thing. Yeah. You got Star Trek, you got sci-fi, you have Monty Python, which is my yeah. personal favorite. You have uh, some of the newer ones. They they have math flux, science flux. The, so they, they you can use them for educational purposes as well. Mm-hmm. So it's got your your pick your poison. It's ridiculous gameplay. It leads to a lot of shenanigans. Uh, there's zombie flux if you're into that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so. I love the ever-changing roles that Munchkin can do sometimes, too. It's like, okay, i got to get this. No, no, this guy is now pumped up to 20, so you got to be to him at a level 20 for you to, to go yep. out to level 10 kind of shenanigans. Uh, so, yeah, it is, it is it's a fun little game. It has the same problem that Illuminous is talking about uh, with Munchkin, where it can yep. go along for a while, especially if all the roles are changing, uh, the goals are changing, people are changing things out, because right. you... you at its core, you draw one card, you play one card. Yeah. 
but the rule can change where you draw four cards, you play two cards, or you draw four cards and play your hand out. And yep. so it just depends on how the rules are changing as you're going, and you're just trying to manipulate it where you can meet the end game. Uh, there are some bad cards in there called Creepers. Usually you can't win with Creepers. Now there are certain goals that allow you to win with Creepers. But yeah, no, Flux is a fantastic game. Uh, I really, I still enjoy playing this game. We bust sure. out Monty Python every so often. So, yeah, Flux is my replay value. Cool. Um, I want similar idea, but one of the things that really brings me into replay value with Munchkin, uh, yeah, Masmo just said, <laughs> best description, never ending. Um, we yeah. normally play the short version where we normally start yeah. at level 5 and then go from there, so a lot of the other stuff is pretty simple. Um, but uh, that brings the game down like by an hour almost, yeah. it seems. But I did find a game that I felt... Uh, brought out the same silliness and the obscene amount of expansions. Because, like, Munchkin has little packs of expansions. Mm -hmm. It's, like, uh, about like 60 to 100 cards did or something. Did they have, like, their own CCG at one point, too? Yeah, they did. They had a CCG, too, right? But, like, they would sell, like, little packs of, like, 18 cards or mm -hmm. 20 cards or something. Like, puppies. Here you go. Just have puppies in yeah, there. Yeah, kind of about... More curses. This or, size. Yeah, exactly. And you could buy these little blister packs of just expansions to add on to it. Uh, and so I was like, man, every single one of those adds like just a little bit of silly flavor to it. You could pick your poison, enjoy like all of the silly stuff added into it. And so much my favorite promo that they've ever made for it, which I absolutely love and I have one of them and it, I will never get rid of it. It's the imaginary friend promo. Have you seen that one for mm -hmm. Munchkin? No. It's it's a blister like it has like a like a three D blister thing like a, like a little figure in it. Mm -hmm. It's completely empty. And so your imaginary friend, it's shaped like a, a Munchkin character. It's shaped like a spike, like on a pedestal. But the blister is empty. Because he's imaginary. Yeah, he's imaginary. And it's a one-time buff. You get plus five, but you have to open up and break open the seal. And when you open it, you release an imaginary friend. You get plus five to, to your combat. It's the stupidest thing in the world. And I love that absurd humor. So... With my replay value, I found a game that has that same level of silly where you can just take a single pack, add it in, has crazy amounts of variability, and so much so that they've even made a Munchkin version of this game, I picked Smash Up because there is no other game that describes Smash Up better than, uh, or Munchkin better than like Smash Up. That's like the hand in hand game for me. Silly art, uh, you can play it again and again and again with different flavors different styles, different expansions, and it's going to keep working. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, what's funny is uh, Smash Up did not go on my list here. As much as I like Smash Up, and I agree with you, it's a good pick. My thing is, um, I picked Smash Up for one of our last brainstorms, so I wanted yeah. to come up with five new games. That that was the only thing I did. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say, it's like, man, it can take a while like to Smash Up on a full player count. So can yeah. Munchkin. <laughs> so can so Munchkin, yeah. That, that's, that's nothing different at all. So, all right, let's go on to Meaningful Choice. And so Meaningful Choice, we talk about impacting on other players' strategies, uh, the depth of strategy, tactics, and skills, and do arbitrary choices or AP impact the game. Um, as we said at the top of this, this game is super silly. It's not to be taken seriously. So, and it, there's a lot of take that. There's a lot of just ridiculous things that you're going to be causing the other players to have to just deal with. And so for that meaning, I picked Flux as well um, <laughs> for a meaningful choice because it does have that, right? It's less take that than, than um, Flux has, although Flux does have take that. You, you basically mean Munchkin. No, you, Flux you, does too. No, but I'm saying you compare Flux to Flux. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. But Flux to Munchkin, I mean, they both have take that in it. You know, they both have silliness. Um, the rules can change, whether you're cheating in Munchkin or whether you're causing the rules to change in Flux, you know. They, they just have that same, like, you know, you're going to be beholden to those cards. It's yeah. going to be random. And even, like, Flux on the box says, I think... Gameplay is between 5 to 120 minutes or something like that. Like they put just like this massive range. They're not wrong. They're, they're not <laughs> wrong, but it's like, wow. It, it could be any number of that, those minutes. So, I mean, I for the same reason you picked Flux, I picked it for Meaningful Choice. But yeah, I couldn't agree more. Alright, so for my Meaningful Choice, uh, this is a game that actually is older than uh, Munchkin. Oh, okay. Uh, funny enough. But... 
it falls along the lines that Munchkin does as well. It has a lot of shenanigans, a lot of negotiation, mm -hmm. a lot of either working together, first a certain uh, set of points and stuff like that. But instead of points, it's planets. My meaningful choice is cosmic encounters. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, yes, you have some asymmetrical characters. It, like I said, it's got a lot of shenanigans here because you're trying to take it over does. a certain amount of uh, planets. You have to negotiate possibly with some people. Uh, mm -hmm. There, There is a power or a group that you cannot negotiate with other people, but you yeah. have more power than the rest yep. of the people. Uh, and so it has everything that you want that Munchkin has, the backstabbing, the shenanigans, the outright uh, just yelling at each other across yeah, the table. The ability to push yourself onto other people's situations. Situations, yeah. yeah. Is there. And that's why I think... But it also leads to like some smart choices that you need to do more yeah. so than Munchkin. Be like, if I go over here and take this and I don't take this person's deal, then there I might get ganged up on because these people are probably going to protect this person and stuff like that. So maybe sure. if I take his deal and we take it together, I ra maybe I share the victory rather than just winning outright. And yeah. so... It lends to a lot of that that fun shenanigans, and if you don't want cosmic encounters, say you do want something fantasy realm, there is a Game of Thrones version of it. So yep. if the you Iron find Throne. that the Iron Throne, you could check that out. But yeah, for me, the when it comes to the meaningful choice, cosmic encounters was one of the first ones that came in my mind. Okay, yeah, I can see that. I didn't. It didn't even cross <laughs> mine, but that's yeah. You're not wrong on it. All right, now we have game immersion, and that'll be me as well. So game immersion talks. First off, is the game fun to lose? Uh, what kind of player interaction, what kind of role-playing are you getting into, and finally, those memorable stand-up moments. Um, I brought it up earlier, it's like, yeah, like, I'll gladly help you with that fight. No, I don't think I'm going to need your help. Now you will. <laughs> and it's right, right? Yeah. It's one card m makes or breaks it, you know? Mm -hmm. And Munchkin, I also said that it was uh, a D&D &D spin-off, right? Yeah. It's like this fantasy... Uh, oh, I think I know what this is, then. Do you? I'm curious, make a, make a prediction. Uh, do you want me to say it out loud? It is not a game I own. Oh, okay, maybe not then. Because I was thinking when you said D&D-esque, I figured this was going to be on your list. Dungeon Mayhem. No, I thought about <laughs> that, but it's... That one doesn't have as much into it. Because, I mean, you really do take in the tropes of Dungeons & Dragons and Munchkin, right? Yeah, okay. And that's one of its biggest charms, is that, you know, you, you know that the people who, who played the game really appreciated role-playing games. I mean, there's even one part where it's like, bribe the GM with snacks and you gain a level. It's like, that's that's absolutely ridiculous. So I wanted something that was just as ridiculous, um, that had that, you know, fantasy dungeon crawl charm to it. And this is not a game that I own because it's just not my style for my group, but a lot of the people who do love this game really love this game, and I know plenty of people who do that. This is Red Dragon Inn, and... I, yeah, no. I, I And I couldn't... I couldn't help but put this on my list because this is. I normally recommend games that I personally own. Mm -hmm. This I don't own it just because I don't like that. But um, basically, in Red Dragon Inn, you are fantasy dungeon crawlers, and you're back at the Red Dragon Inn, trying to embellish your story a bit, really kind of brag about the quests that you went upon, getting people to buy you drinks when your um, when your victory points or whatever your your blood content and your alcohol level cross. Then it's then it's your the game is over and whoever has the most wins. You're trying to get those two to cross, which is a fun theme. But just by the fact that you're saying these just ridiculous stories, like do you remember that one time that I absolutely decimated a level one potted plant? You know, <laughs> it's like well, I fought that whole dragon with one finger. Let me tell you, and you're embellishing these stories, <coughs> causing s silliness, um, and it's just a good party setting that people who want that I've seen. If you like Munchkin, I've found a lot of people like it for the same reason. Red Dragon Inn, that's my recommendation for game immersion. Yeah, I'm not going di to uh, disagree with that. It's it's a fine game. I wasn't a big fan of it when I played it, but sure. I understand why some people like it and some right. people don't. Uh, so it's for, just not our style. Yeah, it's right? not our style. But, yeah. So my game immersion is the equivalent of your bonanza. It doesn't hit a lot of the stuff that you like munchkin you're talking about uh D D esque uh yep. characters and stuff like that this has nothing to do with D. &D. Mm -hmm. uh but what i wanted to go i wanted to get a game recommendation for people who want something that can give you the shenanigans that you love a little bit of the backstabby that they love in that game 
but still more of a modern take of a game uh, and situation. And this one, I went with most more uh, post-apocalyptic than anything. This is one of the newest restoration games, and I went with the shenanigan-filled Thunder Road Vendetta. Uh, the reason why I went with this one, one, okay. dice chucking fun, you're going to have good times, but it does lead to those uh, memorable moments where you're trying to kill the guy who's in the lead. And that's the main thing about Munchkin. There's a point in Munchkin where yep. it's like everybody has to pile on this yep. guy. And that's what, what when it came into my mind, we were talking about Munchkin, I was like, Sure. There is that point. You and me were trying to kill Dammit Dom because he was leading the race and we were using our helicopters yeah. and they were useless. <laughs> our helicopters did not do a darn thing. Yeah. And we were like trying they to set nothing. it up. They just swarmed him. Yeah. We tried to set it up where we get him like if he falls under our helicopter, he blows up. We're trying to shoot our him and he's like, no, no, I'm good. Yep. Every time. You <laughs> Every time. You and yeah. me were both using our helicopters. Our buddy... Uh, uh, Gamehead Geek has already killed himself by running into walls left and right. <laughs> he, he took care of himself real fast. Yeah, we didn't have to worry about him. Yeah. We had to go pick on Dom because he, he was running away with it. And that's what Munchkin's all about is like that fun, those shenanigans, those stories. And that's what we're yeah. talking about, the game immersion. And that's why I was like, Thunder Road Vendetta hits all these things even though it doesn't really match the theme or the mechanisms in a sense because you're not card playing. You're rolling dice. Mm -hmm. But... Those shenanigans that we've been talking about, those backstabbiness where, no, there is a runaway leader. We need to go take care of this. And he just ducks, dives, dips, and dodges everything. <laughs> so it it's it had to be Thunder Road for Vendetta for me. Like I said, it's my cheaty pick. It doesn't really fit a lot of those things. But if that's what you get into Munchkin for, those shenanigans, yep. those having a good time, telling a fun story after you're done. Remember that time when we tried to kill Dammit Dom and he just... Our helicopters did absolutely butt kiss to him. That's what I'm That's going it. for with this one. Yep. And so it was for me, it was Thunder Road Vendetta. Okay, you sold me on it. <laughs> and our last one is art and production. Shall we? Shall we? All right. This one's me. So when we're talking about the art and production, we're talking about, of course, the art. Uh, very famous with Munchkin, John Kavalik art. Yep. Uh, the pieces of components and the graphic design. Is it legible, readable, understandable, or in our case, colorblind friendly? And now we don't really run into that problem with Munchkin. Yeah, Munchkin doesn't have any specific yeah. colors. You're just playing matter. cards and wherever yep. you go, goes. We don't have to worry about, like, the color wheel and stuff like yeah. that. Very, very text heavy, but it's still, like, since every card is different, it has no flavor, <coughs> that makes sense. Yeah, and then another thing, too, is uh, with Munchkin, if you just buy the base game, uh, they didn't come with a board originally. You right. could just buy it's card just cards. Games. Now that they, they have a board in there, if I remember correctly. The deluxe version. The, all yes. the deluxe versions will come with boards. Yep. I wanted to do something that um, kind of hit a lot of what Munchkin is. We got the art, John Kavalik, or who was the other guy you mentioned earlier that does some um, of the art? Ian too? McGinty. I Ian McGinty. So you want some of the fun, comic booky kind of art. Mm -hmm. uh, you want some really decent components. Uh, it's fine. The Deluxe Edition has a nice board. They have like player pieces that you know where your character is on the board and stuff like that. But really good card art, uh, card uh, card stock, and stuff like that. But I want something that also gives you the backstabbing nature of this game. And so what I came with for my art production, I think, is by far one of the best ones I ever came up with. It's Shenanigans. It's got John Kavalik art in it. And it has foam gun pieces that you're pointing at your opponents. I picked Cash and Guns 2nd Edition. Uh, so, yep. like I said, it has a lot of that party aspect that you get from munchkin uh that's what we used to play all the time in a group setting because you can play a lot of people in munchkin was that and then we got introduced to cash and guns and we started playing that and that one leads to a lot of memorable moments as well as like when we we're talking about it when i picked thunder road of vendetta but this is by far one of the best produced cheap games on this list uh, because of those foam guns and stuff like that it has a few expansions out there too but i couldn't go with anything better other than this because the shenanigans just in this game alone really makes you feel like you're playing something Munchkin-esque. Yeah. Cool. All right. And then the last one I had for art and production, I went with just a single card game. Um, uh, in the board game community, I mean, other than, like, the new age artists, like we have Andrew Bosley and Best Sobel Sobel. and, like, all these others, like, that are really hot names right now, John Kavalik was kind of the one, right? Yeah. I mean, he you recognize his art. 
you knew that he was like the main guy so much that like um i'm very proud i'm gonna flex a little bit because i was very proud of this moment because this was my first gamma and right before that um our local store commissioned me to build a six foot tall spike and so i made it out of styrofoam uh you know painted it scaled and everything got it and it's still a model it's still in our store which yep. is awesome and they were very i was very proud of that fact and i took a picture of it and that first gamma when i met john Kavalik, i was like sir i gotta show you this and i showed him that he was like that's amazing send it to me and he, <laughs> i think he sent it on twitter or facebook or something right and he was like this is awesome right and so i was like yeah flexing moment anyway i loved it and but outside of gaming you know he's not known that well unless you've seen like stuff like apples to apples he did the art for that one mm -hmm. at least the apples on the cover and he's done a few others that are pretty well known but I wanted to find, because of how charming the silly, ridiculous, absurdist art is, I wanted something that embodied that. And I found a game that is just a card game that has this absurdist art that a lot of people are very familiar with this artist outside of gaming. I picked the Stephen Rhodes game, Let's Dig for Treasure. Oh, okay, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And it takes that absurdist idea. Because the comparison that, in my mind, first off, you had... Um, you know, like the leather armor and you have like basically a dominatrix, right? The boots of butt kicking with this massive spike on the front of the, on the front of the toe. Um, you have like the gentleman's club and it's like just a silly, silly club. And like a lot of, there's faces on a lot of things and it's just absolute ridiculous humor, right? And I feel Steven Rhodes games, although a little darker and a little more, uh, not grotesque, but like demented i guess yeah they're a little more demented they are still there to point out that absurdity and i like as you're playing let's take for treasure you're pulling a card one by one and then you just sit back for a minute it's like why did you find like grandma's cookies in a <laughs> graveyard like what <laughs> why are we doing this oh suddenly there's a nuke like what sewage or, or like um or nuclear fallout or then it's like oh we find the evil skeleton or like the wedding dress you know it's like what and these kids are just on the cover like, huh? <laughs> yeah. Why are we finding it? And it's just, it just makes you laugh. And those are one of the few things I did. It didn't have much more to do than just a card game with silly art. And I, I feel fit with that. And I found a lot of people like both of those for the same reason. It's it's always interesting when we do brainstorms like this. I mean, I don't disagree. The pick, I think, Let's Dig for Treasure is fine. But we come at these approaches yeah. quite differently. You're coming more the mechanista, uh, what is sure. a lot like it, how it does it. I'm like, I want something that gives me the feel of that. And I, I like this aspect mm -hmm. of us, how we do we come at it at two different points. Sure, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. So give us your recommendations. If you watch this on YouTube, add it in the comments or anywhere else that you listen to it or hear it. Uh, let us know your thoughts. If people like rec like Munchkin, maybe have cooled on it. What game is the next one you'd recommend? Same with the friends in our chat, Masmo Luminous. If you guys have any recommendations, throw those on there as well. I just wanted to read this out real quick. Luminous did incorporate um, Red Dragon in, into their D&D campaign, which and is hilarious. Masmo adds uh, Liar's Dice to his. Right, exactly. Yeah, uh, no, I, I think that's hilarious. Uh, and then, <laughs> as you're critiquing his pick for Liar's Dice. Yeah. Anyway, let us know what you think <laughs> from Munchkin recommendations for people who play Munchkin. But besides that, if you ever want to contact us directly, email us at everydayboardgames2020 at gmail.com, whether that's enter in future contests, just to hint, say hello, hint, hint, hint or uh, whether that's just to give us ideas for future episodes. Also, we have an Instagram account, instagram.com slash everydayboardgames. We're getting a little more active on that. We're trying to do some silly videos and some pictures, try to post just about every game that we play. So come check it out, everydayboardgames uh, on instagram.com. I also have a really funny, uh, a silly video on there <laughs> based on what we talked about at the beginning of this That's podcast. Right. So go check it out. I, on our I reels. do enjoy that one. Uh, as well as all video re-uploads are found on YouTube as well as some of our shorts. So if you don't want to watch them on Instagram, they are on YouTube at youtube.com slash everyday board games. And if you like what we do, there are three things you can do to help us grow on the platform. Subscribe if you're not, like the video, and comment down below and tell us your thoughts on the subject. And if you ever want to join us on a live taping of our podcast, we stream this every time on twitch.tv slash everyday board games. And you can join us and, and join us in on the conversation, like our friends Illuminous, Masmo, and anybody else who joined us today. And all audio versions can be found on most podcast platforms. This includes uh, under Everyday Board Games Podcast. This includes Spotify, Amazon Music, Podbean, and Apple. 
So we want to thank you so much for tuning in. As always, I've been your host, Daniel. And I've been your host, Daniel. And we want to thank you for listening to Everyday Board Games. And remember, every day is a good day for board gaming.